Hello, welcome to this episode of Inspiring Artists. The uh, person I'm speaking today, all the way uh, from Australia, is Peter Drew. Hi, Peter. Hi. Thanks for having me. I think yeah, you, you're probably the, the you know we've done a, quite a few of these interviews now, and, and you're definitely the furthest away. Uh, you're in Adelaide, isn't that right? Yeah. yeah. What's it like over there at the moment? What's uh, how's it how's it's it going? Good. It's sort of the uh, middle of winter, but that doesn't really mean very much uh, from Adelaide point of view. It just means it's a little bit colder than normal. But um, I'm still getting out and doing uh, doing my stuff on the street, so it doesn't stop me. And uh, but. Because of the pandemic, uh, I can't really travel around to Melbourne and Sydney as I would be doing normally. So, yeah, what I've actually been doing is sending my posters out to people for them to stick up. I made sort of a video to teach people how to stick them up. And they're, um, they're themed around the pandemic as well. So it's sort of, it's, it gives something, it gives my followers something to do and it's better than me just sort of sitting on my hands mm. uh, because I really like traveling around Australia and sticking up posters. I suppose you get to see quite a few different places and meet, meet a lot of people in terms of the work, work that you do. You've got to find the spots, you've got to find the walls, you've got to find somewhere where the, the posters look good, that they're going to uh, be seen. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the t uh, so the posters that you've, you've you took, it's the together soon enough pieces. Yeah, yeah. So it's just a it's a it's an image of uh, a blue figure hugging uh, someone, but the it, the negative space you can see that the the person is missing, um, and it's just when the whole COVID thing kicked in, I didn't. First of all, I didn't really want to be another person saying uh, there were a lot of people sort of just repeating the messages of the authorities, which is fine, I guess, but it's sort of it's a bit redundant just to be telling people to stay home and, and wear a mask because, um, you know, art should say something that the authorities aren't saying. Um, yeah, otherwise, it's sort of, um, you know, art has the opportunity to say something that the authorities can't, that the authorities don't know how to say. Um, and I, what struck me in those first couple of weeks when the pandemic was kicking off was just the irony that, in order to protect the ones we love, we need to be distant from them. And it's quite a difficult thing to uh, come to grips with. Um, I realized I was gonna uh, miss uh, family members and, and it was all in order to take care of them. Uh, and so I came up with this poster, which is about sort of missing that uh, need for affection. And I printed it um, and started, you know, sending them out to people for free so they could stick them up. And, uh, you know, and so that's been great fun to see other people because it's fun sticking up posters and I've always really enjoyed it, but I've always sort of shied away from uh, making it uh, participatory because I don't know, I just, I like making sure that I stick it in the right place, et cetera, et cetera. But with this, I thought, look, this is something that really, um, it'd be great to see other people enjoy the whole process of, um, taking some ownership of public space as well of, of like of sticking up a poster in your local area and then it's been great to see getting messages from people and them saying oh i've seen people stopping and looking at the poster and it's and it becomes a way of them using public space to talk to their community there's a lot of um hope that comes out of that poster as well you know, I think when I, I first saw it, that's the thing that I took away from it. I thought, because you did it at the height of the pandemic and everyone across the world pretty much is locked down. And, and when you see that, that poster, you know, those two figures, you know, hugging, that, that's, that's, is that what you intended as well? That sort of, you know, hopefulness? Yeah, because a lot of my stuff is sort of political and not so much divisive, but it tries to find some sort of compromised middle ground, not compromised rather, but a middle ground based on compromise because the piece is always sort of a compromise in some sense. But, but I wanted to do something that was uh, far less political um, just because, you know, there are some problems that, um, that politics makes worse in, in a sense, or at least, you know, it's us versus a pandemic. It's, we need to, in some sense, resist that urge to sort of lay blame and, and go to the, um, 
go to the mechanisms of politics and start sort of saying, well, why isn't good enough? I mean, you know, there's, <laughs> there's, there's a role for that, but it's just, um, it doesn't do everything. Um, and, I, and I wanted to, and, and there was this feeling of sort of panic and fear as well, this mass fear of like, what is happening? How bad is this going to get? What should we do? Let's start buying toilet paper. You know, that like all these uh, irrational behaviors started coming out, which I thought were fascinating. But I just think that art has a unique, uh, is in a unique position. It has unique ability to um, sort of calm some of those irrational fears uh, and in, in ways which politics really um, it doesn't have that ability. So I, I wanted to come up with a poster that, that did something in that sphere. And ha what sort of places did it get to? So you're in Adelaide. Yeah, people are contacting you through social media. You're sending these posters out you, to, around the world. So, you, so suddenly you've got this massive poster campaign. Uh, so organic poster campaign going on. What sort of places um, has it found itself in? Well, it's uh, a couple to the UK, Sweden, uh, a couple to the States. I didn't send heaps overseas because I think people realised as well it was going to take up. There was sort of a, a postage backlog and um, it's taken, it took, like the one, I sent one out to Sacramento in, I think that's in California, and um, a guy stuck it up only very recently and I think I sent it off almost two months ago. Like it's, you know, it takes, there's a big backlog of postage. Um, uh, but most, the vast majority of them have been uh, around Australia. So just, you know, hundreds to um, Victoria and, and New South Wales, especially. So I visited um, uh, Australia. I was fortunate enough to go last October and November and I came to Adelaide and that's how I discovered your work really. And your poster and your paste up uh, art is what we might call them, call it over here. And um, the, the, the pieces that really stood out for me, this is before the pandemic and all that, uh, were the Aussie posters. So you got pictures of um, uh, people with the word Aussie written in um, big bold letters at the bottom. Can you tell me something about that campaign? Because it wasn't just Adelaide that saw that. Once again, uh, you know, went to Melbourne, went to other places in, in Australia, saw them all over too. It, sounds, it looks like that was an impactful campaign. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the photographs, the first thing um, I have to explain about them is the photographs are sort of, they look like portrait photographs. Um, I found them in the Australian National Archive. They're all from around 100 years ago. And they, the photographs were taken for, uh, they were ID photographs for exemptions to the white Australia policy. The white Australia policy was a collection of immigration policies from about 1901 to the 50s or so that stopped non-white people from entering Australia. And so, but in order to have the, implement this policy, they had a dictation test because they didn't want, it, that's what's so interesting about it is that they didn't want to just come out and say, look, this thing's called, the, it, it was never officially called the white Australia policy, but yeah, they didn't, they wanted an element of subterfuge to hide the fact that they were being racist. So they had a dictation test. And if you're entering Australia, it, they could issue you a dictation test. And if you passed it in English, they could just keep giving it to you in other languages until you failed. And so it was this, it allowed authorities to uh, hide the fact that they were being racist. So anyway, um, when it was implemented in 1901, there were already tons, thousands of, non-white people living in Australia and so how and what if they wanted to leave and then come back and so they had a system of exemptions whereby these people could um, apply for an exemption and then they could travel home to uh, India and, uh, or China, China and India especially, visit family and then come back to Australia without fear of being kept out and so that's it's one of these terrific ironies of history that because there was this racist policy, we now have this amazing photographic record of how ethnically diverse Australia was when the, the policy was introduced. So anyway, I found these, uh, these photographs in the archive and I thought this is a great street art project because Australians today would rather identify with the resilience of these people rather than 
the the racism of the people who wrote and implemented the white Australia policy. So I thought, right, I'll use these photographs, put simply the word Aussie underneath them and stick them up around the country. And so I did a crowdfunding campaign to do just that. People could order the posters and I raised enough money to, to travel around and stick up over a thousand of them uh, in all the capital cities. And I've never really stopped in a way because people kept buying them and there are thousands of these photographs and and it's kind of it's never really stopped being relevant because it's that sort of age-old tension between um between nation and uh and ethnicity um because the nation state has never really figured out how to be about um you know, protecting any, it, it, it sort of, it claims to be able to um, protect the people that hold those values uh, that uphold the nation, but it it's always been about um, a certain people uh, in, in sense of ethnicity. So there's that, and it, all I'm saying is just the nation has that sort of tension within its, um, within its makeup. And so um, I, I just think it's a project that I will be able to work on for a long time for that reason. What, so when, so when, would, when did this project start? What sort of uh, time, uh, how long ago was, was this that you first discovered that book? Um, in 2016, I started sticking them up. Um, and yeah, it took up that whole year. It, it was really, really a big project. Um, and, and it's sort of, yeah, it's just continued ever since. I've, I've done other things, but I just think I'll keep doing those Aussie posters forever, really. You, the thing that struck me about them when I when I saw them, I, I, you know, I think you know you've you explained it really eloquently, um, you know, there. But when I saw them, I think I think I, um, you know, I felt the same of what you, as what you just said. You know, I, th- I think I feel that when I saw the poster, I just um, instinctively got uh, the 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 description that you you made there, just be, because, you know, it, it, you know, we're living in a in a uh, in a world where nationalism is is quite rife there's a lot of um nationalist politics uh, going around and and um unfortunately racism could, could be seen as being at the, at the center of some of this politics that's that's happening and when you see um you know people f- you know you know emblazoned in front of you you know that are, that um you know like Mongo Khan at, at the at behind you, just just uh, just there with the word Aussie emblazoned. That's sort of re- really making a statement, isn't it? It's really making a statement that you know people are living here. Everyone's an, an Aussie. Everyone's contributing. Everyone's um, equal. Really, that's what I was taking away from it a little bit. Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, that's that's one of the great things about art is that you can, you know, I can you can condense all of that into information that you can get in an instant. Um, and it's kind of uh, getting it right in terms of design and uh, intent. It's yeah, it's in a lot of ways, it's the, um, it's a process of, of uh, sort of peeling away the things that are, are going to distract from an exact message. And, and the, um, the hero image of the, um, of that project was of Monga Khan and I, I searched for the archive looked through hundreds of photos before I found his and thought that's absolutely the one because he looks sort of obviously Muslim and and you've got to remember 2016 was a particularly bad year for just sort of rising xenophobia and especially sort of uh, Islamophobic sentiment in australia especially there was a um there's a terrorist attack and at the very start of the year and so the isis videos had just started coming out in sort of especially in late 2015 i think that they were you know there was this real feeling of what's happening how much worse can it can it get um and he and then i found this image of bonga khan and he just he uh, i picked him because he looked strong and sort of and regal and like you you'd see him, his photograph and you go ah oh, not only do you do you like him but you, a part of you identifies with him as being heroic because he looks um like someone you'd like to emulate you know he has a strength to him um and i thought that's something that sort of 
it's the, the you know when, when you come up for a project like this it, you, you got to think about uh, sort of the emotion that it's conveying because i don't want to show i don't want to go with sort of uh, sympathy or compassion it was more to um you know there is it on a very simple level when you see an artwork you really like or music you like or a film you like there's a part of you that wants to be the person uh in the film or in the movie or it's, it's this feeling of, I wonder what it's like to be them. And that's, um, that's kind of the most fundamental, like, in a really basic way, that's sort of what art and culture does, is it makes you go, oh, I want to be that person. I want to emulate them in some way. And, you know, you know that from when you're a kid. And I think it's easy to forget that with, uh, with art in some ways. It becomes very theoretical. But at the very base level, it's sort of just mimicry. You see the thing you want to be and you... Uh, try to emulate it. So I, I, I just, when I saw his image, I thought, wow, that guy's, he's got some real strength inside of him and you can tell just by looking at him. And that's, uh, and as soon as I saw the photo, I thought that's the one I'm going to use that to, um, to carry the whole project in a lot of ways. Do you know any other background information about Mongo Khan? Do you, do you know what he did or, or little, who he was little, or? Little bits and pieces. Like he he worked as a, a hawker in Victoria, a hawker like a, a, a sort of a travelling, basically a travelling salesman. He had a horse and cart, and uh, travelled around the sort of the Ballarat Ararat area, um, selling wares. So, um, yeah, and I uh, visited his his visited his grave in Ararat, and it's a very sort of um, it's just a number tag on a piece of ground. Um, but I don't know very much. I mean, there are, um, and, and in a way that's sort of, um, I have been contacted by relatives, um, mostly in the UK, actually. Well, I don't know whether they are relatives. It's sort of, you, you they sort of say, I, I think that's uh, my um, great grandfather or something. And I just sort of, you know, usually they just want to have a poster, so I send them a poster. <laughs> but, um, um, but yeah, it would be interesting to do that. But in a way, like, I think there's a very big difference between an art project and a history project. Uh, the intention of this project is, uh, was really to um, evoke the imagination and wonder who mm. Mongo Khan was. And in order to do that, you don't actually want to answer the question of who he actually was. That you need the question to remain active in some sense and create space for mythology, which is is all about the imagination. And the the reason why it's important to do that is because that sort of pocket of imagination is where um, people today project themselves. Whereas if you sort of close it off with "this is exactly who he was," that's what he was, not what you imagine him to be. It's sort of you're missing an opportunity. Um, obviously, there's room for both, but I'm an artist, so what I do is mythology. And and there were so that so Mongo was was really the sort of key image, the cornerstone image of the campaign. But there were, there were other posters as well. Can you tell me about the the other people that you uh, you know featured in the campaign and why you featured those? Yep. Um, I in the original sort of lineup, I think I had uh, eleven images. I, I honestly just picked them for who looked interesting. Uh, there was only one woman because out of, I looked at about, I guess around 300 images and there were only two women in, in all, well, no, there only three women in all of that because just women were less mobile than, um, just had less social mobility. But it was, it was I mean, most of these, uh, people had traveled to Australia to work and so that's it's interesting actually the three women who were uh, who I found were all had all actually been born in Australia uh, so there were two uh, sisters from the Sim Chun family it was a Chinese family that had were living in South Australia and there was a girl from Broken Hill who whose father was a uh, Camellia and who uh, and then she was born in Broken Hill and so anyway um, yeah of the mix there was a bunch of Camellias um, and 
hawkers as well. Um, but mostly sort of, uh, yeah, and a mix of sort of Indian and Chinese. Um, and yeah, and a couple of people who were, who were born here also. So it was sort of, I don't know, I tried to just get a bit of a mix um, from what I saw, but I really just mostly picked the images from just, I don't know, you see an image and some images have a little more interest than others. Or at least you see something in the person that, well, it's just a good photograph that it captures something that's, that's interesting about them, whether it's their, their personality or uh, whether they are wearing something interesting or, you know, I just, just picked as interesting a photos as I could find. It seems like, um, you know, just, just hearing you there, so these are the, these are the people that sort of built Australia to some extent as well. So, you know, they, these are the workers, aren't they? These are the people that um, yes. uh, are doing doing the the jobs. You know, they're they're the hawkers, they're the builders, they're the people that are making things ha things happen on a day to day basis. And just hearing you now, and just just thinking a little bit about it, I'm just, that's what I'm putting on them. So well, they're ordinary people. Ordinary yeah, folk. They're just, yeah, they're not. They're not. Uh, their whole idea was to take someone who was just an ordinary guy. Monga Khan and make him famous because there are, you know, we see other historical figures uh, from that time and they achieve things, whether it be in, in politics or, or what have you. But it's interesting to think that there are thousands of other people who are also contributing and, and sacrificing um, and, and history sort of forgets them, but they are, a lot of them are heroic in their own little way. And there's something more, I don't know, I guess identifiable about that because that's a bit like us, you know, we're all just doing our thing and, um, and uh, I don't know. And it, it's, some, the, it's the unlikeliness of it that these people had their photos taken for this racist policy, but we can, uh, you know, pick them out of obscurity and, you know, they never would have known that this no. little photograph could be, can be made famous, but it sort of, uh, it allows us to sort of, um, I don't know, bend the gears of history or something and, 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 and decide for ourselves, you know, we don't have to, um, you know, we can decide what parts of history we really pay attention to and what we, um, uh, and what it means to us. So, um, I just, I just think that's, that's fun for as an art project to sort of, to get engaged with those ideas. What, what got you interested in post art in the first, uh, for the, the first place and, and doing paste ups, what was, what was the appeal? Um, well, I, I did a lot of stencils. I never really was into freehand aerosol. Um, and I, I did stencils a lot. Um, but I, um, doing paste ups, I uh, really, I just realized, um, I love that medium because I could do all the work in the studio and work on one idea that I could repeat and, um, and it's 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 sort of it's less has less impact on the um, on the street in terms of illegality. If you get caught doing a pay stop, you can just uh, usually get away with it. I uh, and I like that, and I liked um, there was less pressure on the one piece, um, you know, because you you do the work in the studio, and, and if one gets destroyed, it doesn't matter. You can print a thousand more. Um, and it allows you to have a project that an entire city can see. You know, if you have a series that uh, people in the city see in one place and then they see somewhere else and then somewhere else, then it becomes a talking point and you can really, you know, take over a whole city for a moment or at least everyone's sort of talking about this project that you've done. Um, and that, that to me had so much more power than just one spectacular piece, or at least it has a different kind of power. Um, and, and that appealed to me. And so, um, yeah, I just sort of gradually gravitated towards, towards pay stops. Now it's really, um, it's really all I do so, <laughs> in terms of work on the street. So, yeah. But did you, did you, had you been a, a, a writer, graffiti writer before, and did you, you did stencils before that? Was it, had you, had you done no. the street art? No, like I did lots of aerosol stencils, but never sort of freehand aerosol. I just didn't come from that background of, of tagging and pieces. Um, although that's sort of, you know, 
the foundation of graffiti culture. Um, it's just not how I got into it. So. Right, well, uh, Peter, thanks for talking to me. I've kept you quite a long time. Um, uh, wonderful to hear about this project. I think it's absolutely, you know, you know I mean, I love the Aussie project. And I loved it when I, when I first saw it. You know, when you see a, a piece, you think, actually, you no, know, that's cool. I need to speak to that guy. That guy there that did that poster. I need to, and here we are, chatting away. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, have a, a great rest of your day, and thanks for talking to me. Thanks for having me.